I know your works. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Truly, my friends, these are great and heavy words. But let's see this. Who is cold? He's the one whose faith and love is frozen. Or he who is devoid of the energy of the Holy Spirit, according to St. Andrew of Caesarea. A cold man. Frozen. And who is hot? As St. Paul says in Romans 12:11, He who is fervent in spirit. He who has a burning, boiling spirit. His spirit is at a boiling point. However, the bishop of Laodicea was neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm. Is it really possible for the spirituality of a faithful to regress and from hot to become lukewarm? Is it possible for someone to taste Christ and to end up behaving at some point in the future as they never tasted Christ? And after having tasted Christ, to turn his back on him and to begin to romance with the world and with the things of this world. It seems, my friends, that it is quite possible and quite tragic. The great majority of the Christians today, at least the contemporary Christians, belong to this class and state. The contemporary Christians are not cold, and they are certainly not hot. Most of them, or most of us rather, are lukewarm. So here we have to do with a great class of Christians And unfortunately, this class of Christians, faithful Christians, who according to prophet Elijah are limping with both legs, these Christians live the psychology of Israel, which Israel displayed a great ease to come forth and worship the true God, but it also displayed the same ease to run off and offer equal worship to the false gods. In this class of the lukewarm faithful, God in the world Christ and Belial, truth and lie, have the ability to compromise and coexist, as St. Paul says. And worse yet, these people who are able to live in both of these worlds of God and Satan, the truth and the lie, at the same time, they can boast about their high level of spirituality and greatness. That they are extremely important and very pleased with their high position. We pointed out Previously, my friends, that this number of Christians is quite high, unfortunately. I assure you that they make it very difficult for the church to minister to them. They are very difficult people to minister to, to try to reach. If you suggest to them to study the scriptures, they will tell you that they already know the scriptures. If you tell them to go to church, they will tell you that they are better off than all the church people who go there. If you tell them to live a spiritual life, they will answer you that that's the only way of life they know, that they already have accomplished this, and they don't see anything in their life that needs to be changed. What pitiful people. My friends, the egotism of these people rises in front of them like the Great Wall of China, which egotism does not allow a single possibility of God's grace to work a change inside of them. Nothing at all. They do not allow God to enter their heart, to change them so they can become people of grace, people of understanding and self-knowledge. Lukewarm characters are unable and incapable of increasing their spiritual thermometer even by one degree, and yet they're under the impression that they are the best that humanity has to offer and the best of Christians. But a paradox announcement of the Lord comes to tell them you're not hot or cold. You are lukewarm. You would be better off cold. This is a strange statement. As you know, this is a paradox, a strange declaration the Lord poses to the Bishop of Laodicea because cold seems to be farther away from hot than lukewarm. At least chemically, uh, lukewarm water is closer to hot degree-wise than cold water. 
Now, why does the Lord prefer someone cold over someone lukewarm? The psychology and the experience based on this clearly proves, my friends, that the man who is cold spiritually is able to repent. His heart has the possibility to change, and he can become a very hot person spiritually. At some crossroad in his life, at some moment, a certain incident, the grace of God touches him. The right hand of the Most High God touches him, and he turns around. He changes his life, and you can see him. Yesterday, he was immoral, unethical. Today, he's pure. Yesterday, he was mocking and ridiculing the faith. Today, he's full of piety. Yesterday, he lived like swine. Today, he's clean and washed from sin. What happened? He repented. How many of these incidents we have? How many? The thief on the cross was cold at first. Both thieves were mocking Christ. It is not a mistake for one of the evangelists says that both thieves crucified with him were mocking him. Whereas Luke says that one of the thieves was calling out, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. This is not a mistake because both of them were mocking the Lord in the beginning. However, at some point, at a certain point, a revolution took place in the soul of the one thief. Of the one thief, not the other. When he witnessed that the Lord is forgiving those who crucified him, when he saw that the Lord does not curse, when he saw his softness and leniency on the cross, he transformed, he changed instantaneously. His soul started to boil. And he said to his other companion, Who are you cursing? Who are you mocking? The Holy One, the righteous. Are we in his class? We deserve death, but not him. And he turns to the Lord. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. From being cold as ice, he suddenly blazed like the sun. And he was the first to enter paradise. This is what the experience and the psychology of the cold shows. On the contrary, the lukewarm stays always lukewarm. The one who does not budge from his position because he's resting on his laurels, because he has the great idea about himself, as I was explaining to you previously. What caused this? St. Andrew of Caesarea provides us with a wonderful explanation of this psychology. The cold man has never tasted the fruit of faith. At some point, he tastes something. He tastes the faith, and immediately he says, this is exactly what I was looking for, and he becomes warm. However, the one who was warm at some point in the past by the Holy Spirit during baptism and that froze because of laziness and spiritual indifference, something that we are all very guilty of, he dismembered himself from the hope of salvation by scorning and criticizing the said faith. Meaning, since he observed something bad or something negative in the church, some scandal, some gossip, the very things we always hear, how can this be done in the church? He cut himself off. He's cut off from the hope of salvation. He said, why bother? I was growing up with priests and I saw how they lived. This priest used to do such and such. This priest does not believe. Why bother? There is no faith. Nothing matters. And he keeps a form of religiosity, lukewarmness, and uses the church as a coffee shop and a meeting place. This person has dismembered himself. He really has no hope of salvation with this mentality. It is truly dreadful. Let's be very careful about this. The first cause of lukewarmness is spiritual laziness, sloth, spiritual indifference. After this, since the lukewarm person does not have the desire to restart his spiritual life, to become warm again, he begins to look for anything negative in the life of the church. He gets stuck on some scandals and possibly the weaknesses of the clergy. 
And uh, why our church doesn't have this program or that program? Why does our church ignore this or that area? And then he slowly poisons himself from all the adverse happenings, and it destroys his hope, and he withers. Constantly take spiritual self-inventory. Am I warm? Do I feel the burning of the Holy Spirit inside of me? Do I feel the spiritual members of my existence upright? Do I have spiritual impulses and inclinations? And do I get excited and do I feel God's presence in different areas of my life? Do I weep and mourn for the bad things which exist in the church? Is the flame of missionary, missionary work burning inside of me like it was burning the Bishop of Philadelphia and he received praise from the Lord? Am I a person of faith and boldness and not a child who draws back, as St. Paul says in Hebrews 10.39? Do I love the Lord deeply, deeply enough to consider everything rubbish for his love? On the contrary, is it possible that I am cold? Is it possible that I am altogether cut off from the energy of the Holy Spirit, as St. Aretha says? Is it possible that I have become a mobile refrigerator of faith and love? Is it possible that I have reached the point of being cruel, harsh, emotionless, merciless, maybe uncaring, antisocial, individualistic, hardened, unloving, tearless, having a heart of stone, and worse yet, is it possible that I took a couple categories from those things that refer to being hot and a couple categories of those things that refer to being cold, mix them together, thus having the hot qualities become lukewarm and finally ending up being neither cold or hot but lukewarm? And of course, this means that I end up being nothing. Five adjectives, one after the other are used to classify this state by the Lord. Don't you know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? My friends, let's consciously name ourselves wretched so we can be happy someday. Let's acknowledge how miserable we are all by ourselves and how poor so the Lord will not have to tell us what he says in the verses of the parable. If they invite you to a banquet, go and sit at the last place, all the way in the back, because you will tell yourself that I am insignificant. I'm unimportant. And don't do this out of an inferiority complex, because this is egotism. Feelings of inferiority stem from egotism. But to truly have the consciousness that I am nothing, unimportant, wretched, miserable. And then the friend who invited you will come and tell you, my friend, come up front. I want you to sit closer to the front and not back there. Come up front. Come on up here. On the contrary, the Lord says in this parable, the banquet, about those who want to be first. If you go and enthrone yourself in the first position, he will tell you, I'm sorry, but this seat is reserved for someone else. And while everyone will be seated, you will have to get up and start looking for a seat. But all the places are taken, and you will have no choice, but you will have to go and take up the seat all the way at the last row, the last position. And, of course, this will be very embarrassing. So this is it. That's why, my friends, let's recognize our wretchedness and our poverty. Let's do this on our own. Let's also acknowledge the blindness of our soul. And in doing this, we will begin to see the things that cannot be seen by those who claim that they can see. Let's also recognize our nakedness in the area of holiness. Let's not claim that we are saints. And then Christ will envelop us with virtues, with virtues granted to us by his grace. If we fail to do this, his threat is around the corner. I will vomit you out of my mouth. 